a new report on the industrial supply chain. Claudio Knizek is global leader of advanced manufacturing with EY. Hello, Claudio. Hello, Bob. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for being with me today. So uh, EI has this new report on the industrial supply chain. Tell me about this survey. Whom did you reach out to? We reached out to executives in industrial companies, uh, really around the world, all key geographies, Americas, Europe, and Asia. So what were some of the key takeaways in this latest survey? So I would say there are, there are several uh, important findings. First, uh, it's pretty clear from the research that we've been doing and through the research of this specific report that there is a major trend unfolding right now before eyes across global supply chains. And that has to do with the uh, decoupling of long extended supply chains that have been put in place over the last 20, 30 years. Essentially, there's a major trend toward setting up new supply chain strategies where the supply chains are a lot more resilient, a lot more agile, a lot more responsive, and uh, in some cases, closer to home. So this is a major transformation that's happening and we were surprised to see the extent to which industrial companies in particular are actually really digging into this and are making changes to their supply chain. North of 50% have indicated that they are rethinking their supply chain strategy and 60% of industrial uh, uh, executives indicated, for, for instance, that they've already made changes to their supply base. Okay. Well, that part is interesting because we've heard talk about this for a long time. We haven't necessarily heard proof of real action in that direction. Your report is saying that it's more than people just thinking about it. Action is already being taken. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, again, uh, we uh, were surprised at, the, at, the, at our findings and um, we see very clear evidence that a number of companies have already started to make changes north of 50%. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, if you look at our report, an additional 40% are planning on making additional changes to their supply chain, whether it's expanding their supply base or, or reshoring um, some of their manufacturing or supply base operations. What are some of the major supply chain challenges that were cited by respondents in this survey? So there were several, and there's, there's a number of exogenous factors that are driving this change. First, macroeconomic conditions over the last 10, 20 years, a lot of increases in wage rates in traditionally low-cost countries. Second, the pandemic caused major supply chain disruptions, as you well know. Third, there's an appreciation for the value of being more responsive, closer, being closer to your customers. Uh, unfortunately, there's also a greater sense of nationalism. We saw a little bit of that in the pandemic where exports were limited. And so some company, some, uh, some, some um, firms were unable to import some of the goods they needed. Those are all factors that are driving this change in supply chain. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to develop a new supply chain model, there will likely be additional factors, including costs that need to be overcome. Yeah, because cost was the reason for the uh, original model of, of uh, offshoring, concentration on China, concentration on other single sourcing situations. So you're thinking then, or you're hearing then, that companies are thinking about more than just the obvious cost and looking into some of the deeper implica implications of their sourcing decisions. That's exactly, that's exactly right, Bob. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, over the last 20 to 30 years, a number of companies went to set up shop in Asia in places like China I and mean, maybe Southeast Asia, really with the sole objective of lowering down their costs. They build long extended supply chains that are now viewed as being fairly fragile, fairly, fairly rigid. And a lot of them really ran, a lot of, a lot of companies ran into trouble during the pandemic and in the months, you know, even after the peak of the pandemic, where they were unable to supply their customers their goods. I think right now they're realizing that, you know, there's trade-offs to think through. Should you really push to lower your cost by an additional one to 2%? Isn't it better perhaps to set up a more agile, responsive supply chain, perhaps with a bit more redundancy? We're seeing evidence that companies are really thinking, rethinking how they optimize their supply chains around things other than cost. For those companies who are looking at changing their sourcing strategy, are you able to separate that into which ones are thinking about 
especially for like sales in North America, nearshoring versus reshoring. In other words, manufacturing back in the United States or manufacturing to closer locations, but not necessarily in the country. That, um, so in our report, Bob, we didn't really um, we didn't really look at the difference of exactly what you said between nearshoring versus reshoring to your home country. That's probably an area of follow up. Now, I will say that both strategies are being looked at extensively across sectors, certainly in the industrial space. And the reason is that there are significant advantages uh, to that. Now, in the case of nearshoring, obviously that gives you access perhaps uh, in the case of the North American market to places like Mexico, Central America that have lower costs. That may make it easier for you to, for the economics to work out. Now, in other cases, we're seeing companies bring back manufacturing and some of their suppliers to, to the United States, and they're able to overcome some of the increased costs through use of automation, through use of digital and analytic tools that allow them to circumvent some of these issues related to supply chain disruptions. And not just changing sourcing, but do you see a real move? It sounds like you were suggesting that companies are waking up to the need for supplier diversification. That single sourcing has caught them out in many cases, especially with the Russia-Ukraine war, has brought that reality home. Are companies now looking at spreading their, their suppliers around the globe, even though that might cost a little bit more and create even more complex supply chains? That's exactly what we're seeing, uh, Bob. North of 60% of our respondents indicated that they have already made changes to their supply base. Now, we don't have the exact detail on whether that's expanding suppliers or moving suppliers to other regions, but through conversations with existing clients, we know that that's definitely a strategy being taken. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies felt that they had all their eggs in one basket, if so to speak, in particular with regard to China, having all their suppliers, all their manufacturing in, in China. And of course, in the early days of the pandemic, uh, they ran, uh, some of them ran into some, some big problems. So I think that there's definitely an appetite to restructure your supply base, add more redundancy, move away from single sourcing. And that often will involve uh, regional diversification, not just diversification of more suppliers within a specific country. But it's a long-term play though, Claudio, isn't it? I mean, you can't just pull up stakes today and change your suppliers tomorrow. What sense do you get is how long a trend this is? How long is it going to take companies before we'll see real changes in their supply strategies? So uh, I, I completely agree with you, Bob, that this is a trend that will likely unfold over the, over the next 10, 20, even 30 years. Mm. By the way, very similar to the setup of global supply chains that also took several decades to be put in place. But uh, you're right in that this is something that takes time. It starts with identifying a need and developing a strategy, but then you very quickly get into implementation challenges. Uh, not a lot of countries have an established supplier park like China, for instance, or like yeah. Eastern Europe. And so you're looking at a situation where you can find suppliers, but they may not be capable yet. They may not have the capacity. And so significant supplier development is needed. Uh, we have several examples of companies that have run into that challenge, but they have been able to overcome those by working closely with their new suppliers but it is absolutely a process that takes many years, if not decades. Certainly, as you're indicating here, it's not just a question of relocating your so-called tier one suppliers, but understanding where all the multiple sub-tiers are very often need to be around the tier ones in some kind of a campus arrangement, or if not, have to be proximate enough so that you don't have, again, the long supply lines that have hurt supply chains. That's exactly now. right, yeah. Bob. And yeah. you know, in some of the work we did, for instance, in uh, the auto industry, we found that even if you did find new tier one suppliers, uh, say in Southeast Asia, they were still relying on their suppliers, for instance, back in China for supply. So really you're still, you're still seeing that dependency in key geographies such as China. There's other examples as well. Well, I hope that we'll have another EY study on industrial supply chains subsequent to this. I hope you guys are going to keep your eye on the market. I know you will. And when you do, I'd like to have another conversation to see if these trends are continuing. But in the meantime, Claudio Knizek of EY, thank you so much for bringing us up to date on these important trends in industrial supply chains and what EI is doing and surveying. And thanks very much for your time.
Thank you, uh, Bob. Appreciate the opportunity. Look forward to chatting again soon.